There are many larger-than-life characters in the world of darts, but Andy Fordham is one of the most popular. In 2004, he enjoyed his finest hour when he won the BDO World Championship. Since then, he has faced sterner battles away from the hockey with a number of health and personal problems. The Viking tells sporting chapters about a career of terrific highs and lows that may not be over just yet. Andy, it's been a turbulent time for you, your, your life in general, ups and downs health-wise. Yeah. And I wanted to start off by talking about that because <clears throat> the front cover of this book, you are unrecognisable from the former larger-than-life self we, yeah. we recognised. And obviously things have been going up and down for you ever since. Uh, how is your health now? Um, for what it's been through, it's, it's not too bad. I mean, the hospital have put off... I mean, the transplant for a while. They actually rushed me in once on a Thursday, and then I got told on a Monday, because the liver they had wasn't suitable, then on a Monday I was told that I might be able to put it off for a while, which I found quite strange, but then I went up there and see them, and they said I could maybe put it off three to five years, and, but it was my choice. I could stay on the on the list or whatever, and I had a chat with Jenny, and, I mean, the way technology goes forward, I thought I'd just wait and see, and at the moment, touch wood, so so it it's, it's seems to be going in the right direction. So we know that the cause of this is is drinking, heavy drinking. We'll come yeah. on to that. Um, it features heavily in the book. Uh, but first of all, I mean, I wanted to applaud you. You shed half your body weight at one point. You went from 56 <laughs> inches waist down, and, and well, it was a bit bigger than that. As I mean, you got up to about 66 in the end. But it was just, I mean, it, I know I needed to lose the weight, but I think it was just too much, too quick. Uh, I mean, it's, it was in less than a year that it, I mean, it all went. And when I used to look in the mirror, and I, I, mean, I didn't like what I saw, because I didn't, I mean, you don't get a chance really to sort of build yourself up. So, I mean, it was just, well, it was just horrible. And famously, of course, you collapsed when you were playing Phil Taylor and yeah. rushed off to hospital, although you're telling me now that you didn't go. No. Well, I got in my mate's car to go up there, and I split my trousers round, round the crutch. And so I told him, just take me home. Don't bother with the hospital. No. In fact, didn't you say back to the pub? Well, yeah, that was home. <laughs> that was home. Um, we'll go on to the darts, because that's obviously been signalled the beginning of, of a decline for you, because you've had to concentrate on your health, so the sport yeah. had to come second. And mm -hmm. as a professional, I imagine that pains you somewhat. But let's go back to happier times first. And your career highlight, you win and the 2004 World Championship, your crown winner, the one that everyone wants to win. It was just an amazing thing. I've actually seen it on DVD because I don't remember it actually being there doing it, which a lot of people don't believe, but it's the truth. I, mean, I think I started drinking about 10 o'clock in the morning and we weren't playing till about quarter past six, half past six. And I don't know how much I had to drink, but... I didn't have to, I don't remember going over the venue, I don't remember going on stage. We had a break and I actually read in the paper that they said they went off for a break and one player went on the dartboard to carry on like, throwing and one slumped in the corner with a couple of large brandies and a bottle of pills, so I know what I've done. <laughs> you know which one they were referring Yeah, I know to. which one I was, yeah. And uh, Your journey to that final, you beat the the man of the moment, I mean Raymond Van Barneveld in the semi. Yeah. Did you think in that final, and I know that you can't remember or recount, but did you think that you w would win? No, I mean, I'm not one of these people that, oh, I've got him next, I'll beat him, I'll do this, I've got, then I'll play the winner of that one and I'm in the semi-final. It doesn't matter who I'm playing, it's, I mean, the next game that I'm playing is, I mean, that's just the hurdle you've got to get over. And Merv, I've played Merv like, quite a few times, I mean, he's a great dart player. And I, did, I think I've beat him a few times before that. But um, I, did, I never go out expecting to win. I go out there trying to win, and I mean, but the game with Raymond was just. I mean, he, he's in the semi-final again. I think I was either four-one down or something, and I just thought, oh well, another semi-final, and he just, it just went mental. The crowd was unbelievable. In fact, Jenny was sitting round, like, facing out from the stage. She was over to the right, and so she, we walk off to the left, and she walked round with Emily to like sort of just say, oh, don't worry and all that. And then slowly I started coming back and coming back. And it just, I mean, it was, I mean, that was probably the, the game of the week for me was against Raymond. I mean, I know winning the final was, I mean, was just an amazing thing, but to beat Raymond like I did, it was just, 
a great achievement, I think. And you openly admit, as we have in this interview already, that you can't remember because you were plastered. You had had so much and consumed so much alcohol that in this final, you don't really know what's happening. And I'm wondering, why did you drink so much when you were playing in your career? Because was it that, did you need that to play at your best? The first time I played in 95, at the, at the lakeside, I played a very good friend of mine called Nicky Turner. We used to play in the same team and the pairs. And at the first, when, I mean, you're first told that you've made it through, it's brilliant. But as it gets closer and closer, you start thinking about cameras, the crowd, and you don't want to make yourself look a fool. And, and so I just drank so much. And the worst thing that could probably happen was it worked. So then every time I played, I just felt I had to do the same thing and it just carried on and on and on. I mean, when you say, I mean, you're drinking something, I mean, I had a hit flask of brandy, which went just like that. And then I was just drinking so many large brandies, I don't know how many bottles of pills. But as I say, the worst thing was it did work and it just went on from there. The other thing that you're quite renowned for is, and I hope this doesn't come out here, but is a, a bit of a foul mouth sometimes and swearing. I thought there were quite a, a couple of good anecdotes about you doing that on television. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people say about doing commentary and things, but it's, it's hard. I mean, I'm concentrating more on not swearing than I am on what's going on. So I'll just end up blabbering about all sorts of stuff. And so that's why I don't really like doing the commentary. Since I've stopped drinking, I think it's calmed down a little bit. Uh, only a little bit, though. <laughs> but, I mean, people could get completely the wrong impression. There's the drinking, yeah. there's the swearing, but actually, you're a family man, mm. you're a genuine bloke, down to earth with your roots. Um, and one, one of the interesting stories that you, that you mentioned was Raymond Van Barneveld, because you really respected him as a player, but after that semi-final, he wasn't a very gracious loser, was he? No, there was a couple of things that were said. Me and Raymond, I mean, we had a couple of run-ins. I mean, we, I'm not one of these people that holds grudges, really. He's, I mean, there's no point. I mean, it's, it's spur of the moment things. Some people say things, but I mean, he, he said quite a few things, and so in the end, it was getting a little bit, a bit stupid. And I had a few words with him, and I mean, we've shook hands again now. And I mean, the thing, what happened was he turned around his, his wife Sylvia wrote a letter or a card saying, "Well done in the final, a bottle of champagne and all that. Sorry, we had to go. We had to go and get a boat. But if he was in the final, we, I mean." There's no way to book a boat, so and just silly things like that. They got you uh, riled. Well, there's, there's no need. I mean, I did hear at one time that he said the worst thing that ever happened to darts was me winning the world championship. But if you talk to the darts companies, I mean, there was they was in a bit of trouble, and when I won it, it's, things just picked up. I mean, tremendously. Do you think, from your opponent's point of view, though, the fact that the drink is aiding your performance and that half the time they're looking into the whites of your eyes and thinking he's not quite all there at the moment and that yet he's beating <laughs> me, do you think that's part of the problem, is that they can't accept, they don't want to admit that they're being beaten by someone who's half cut? Uh, well, I don't really know, but they had the opportunity to do the same thing. I mean, it's, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it, the thing was, I didn't just drink to sort of play darts. I, just, I mean, I, I was a big drinker anyway. I mean, so whether I was playing darts or not, I was... I mean, we lived in a pub, so... Mm. It was just part and parcel. Life's ups and downs. They, they come and they go and they test you, and you've had more than your fair amount mm. of testing. And Jenny, of course, is this big support, your wife, and mm. you've been together for 30... 33 years, I think. 33 years of marriage. So she's been there, she's supported you through it all. She gets poorly. She's gone through a bout of cancer, and mm. and you also had a, a daughter as well that had a an awful time of it. Mm -hmm. How does that happen for you in terms of juggling act, in terms of keeping focused on darts, but also you've got these bigger life events going on? Well, truthfully, when Jenny um, when Jenny got the cancer, it was on New Year's Eve we found out, and we were just closing the pub, and she just came back and told me, and I, I mean it just killed me. I mean, I was going to stop playing darts. I was, I mean, she lost her hair. And one of the worst things I had to do was shave her head one day in the kitchen. And I said to her, I'll shave mine as well. And then she swore that day. <laughs> and then, um, and I said to her, I won't, no, I'll just stay here. Like, we'll get through this. And she said, no, she said, if you don't go and play, she said, then it's, it's got both of us. And she made me go and carry on playing. I mean, she's, she's so strong, it's unreal. Yeah, I mean, without her, I wouldn't be here today. I know that. And of course you've had to lean on her health-wise as well, yeah. and just how serious did this get with your condition? I mean, how close, and I hate to say it, but to death were you? Well, 
I actually thought about taking my own life a few times because it just felt like I was just a totally different person. When I said to Jenny, we might as well finish, I said, because I'm not the person that you know. And and then it was strange because one night we had a bit of a, like a row over half a lager shandy. And the next day I woke up and then I began to realise that it was just, it was my fault. And I, I mean, I used drink as an excuse. Or everything I did, I used as an excuse to drink. If I was coming here today to do this, I'd have to have a drink to make sure I'd be all right when I come here. Go and get on a plane, go have a drink to get on a plane, anything. When I was doing radio interviews at sometimes six o'clock in the morning, and I'd get up at four and start on the brandy and the pills because I'm doing an interview over the phone. And it was just, it was just using everything as an excuse. And when I realised that, it became, I won't say easier, but it, I mean a bit easier because you start to understand it a bit more. But uh, as I say, without Jenny, I don't think I'd, I'd be sitting here talking to you today. I think I'd have probably ended up back on it and probably dead by now. And how do you keep it in check now? Well, with Jenny, every time something said about drinking, I'd just say to them, go and ask Jenny. And they, no, I think most people are scared of her, really. <laughs> <laughs> You're using her to bat people away. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's, it is like a, a shoulder, really, that I, mean, I can lean on. As you say, I can use her as an excuse to not drink, and it helps. I mean, it helps a great deal. So your wife has been a consistent in your life, your children, and um, your down-to-earth roots, which have come out no end in this quote. But another thing is football, and you're a big Rangers fan. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about that. The quote in the book, we aren't like footballers, as you're referring to darts players, who earn fortunes and live in a different world. We're just normal blokes earning a living. Is any of you aspiring to have the lifestyle of a footballer, though? <laughs> Uh, probably the only one at the minute is Phil Taylor. I mean, he's the, I mean, he's a great dark player. You can't take it away from what he's done. It's just, I mean, the nicest possible way. He's, he's like a freak, really. I mean, he's a freak of nature. He's just, I mean, I think it's 20 odd years he's been at the top, and that's just an amazing, an amazing feat. But I mean, he's done well for himself. He's been dedicated. He showed what dedication can do. It's a shame, really, I didn't do it myself, but. I, don't, I mean, I don't think there'd be as many rich dark players as there is rich footballers, though. No, but at the time that you did win the World Championship in 2004, you talk about the phone ringing off the <coughs> hook, there were people coming around doorstepping and knocking the door trying to speak to you. Yeah. The interest in darts, from when you started out as a youngster, it must be overwhelming to the level it's reached now. Obviously, TV deals help. Yeah. Well, it was just mad. I mean, I went home on a Monday and you couldn't get in the pub. There were so many TV crews, so many press. I mean, it was just mad. And it went on and on for about three months. And then I started doing, like, different shows, like the Fit Club and things like that. And it was, I mean, you used to walk around town. And it, from young kids to old people, I mean, giving you good wishes and everything. I mean, it was great. I mean, and after a while, I think with the newspapers, they get a little bit too too close sometimes. I mean, you see them outside taking pictures and I think, I mean, one of them upset my daughter when I was doing the Fit Club. They, they said that, um, I mean, Jenny had took me to Egypt to die. I mean, that's what they put in one of the papers. So she's phoned up crying her eyes out, you've only took Dad away because he's dying. And sometimes, I mean, there's no need for that. I mean, if they want to ask me questions, I'll be quite truthful with them about things. So, I mean, it's, it's a shame really that it gets to that.